Today, I'm pleased to introduce today's session, Foundation Modals Are Going Multimodal, and our guest speaker, James Lay. James currently leads developer experience at 12 Labs, a startup building foundation models for video understanding. Previously, he worked at ML infrastructure startups, such as Superb AI and Snorkel AI, while contributing to the well-known full-stack deep learning courses. He also hosts Datacast, a podcast that features conversations with founders, investors, and operators in the data and AI infrastructure space to unpack the narrative journey of their careers. James is also joined by my colleague, Frank Liu, our ML architect here at Zillis. Welcome, James and Frank. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks, Emily, for, for the introduction. Um, and thanks to Zillis team for, for having me on um, the webinar today. Um, I, um, you know, we've been knowing Frank and the team for, for a while now, actually, uh, you know, uh, based on Emily's introduction, I, I interviewed Frank for my podcast just, just last year. So I learned a lot about kind of the early story of CLS and, and the evolution of the vector database space. So it's definitely my pleasure to, um, to kind of, um, to, to know that and, and got this time to talk about the work that we do with 12 apps in relations to, uh, you know, the, the evolution of the, the broader, uh, language model, you know, foundation model space and, and the important work of, uh, uh, CLX and, and, and the all the vector database company uh, to propel this industry forward. So yeah, the title of my talk is Go Foundation Models uh, Going Model Model. Uh, so just a quick start uh, introduction, you know, the success of a lot of these foundation models, as you see in this slide here, you know, GPT-4, DALI, GitHub Copilot has generated a lot of interest um, in the type of models that can perform a wide range of tasks, right, from things like image captioning to like code generations to visual reasoning. So uh, for today's presentation, uh, I will uh, basically, you know, kind of um, start from, from, from the beginning, talk about the architecture of, you know, these validation models, the training and fine tuning paradigm, as well as um, the important skilling laws. And then I will discuss how a vision language model show up uh, and then that can combine the power of computer vision and NLP and how they can be used to solve a lot of different uh, complex problems uh, in today's age. And then finally, I will talk about the new paradigm of video foundation model, which is essentially a type of uh, multi-model foundation model that uh, combine different modalities and how they are uh, you know, changing the way that we do uh, understanding and analysis of video data. So yeah, let's talk about you know what is a foundation model. So according to you know, this definition from the team of Stanford, just roughly about two years ago, they defined a foundation model as a type of uh, machine model that can learn from a wide range of data using cell supervision scale. And the idea here is to create a model that can be used for many different tasks. By training on a lot of data, this model can learn the general patterns in the data. And so when being used for a specific task, it can use such knowledge to quickly adapt to new tasks. In this concept, a foundation model uh, leveraged to one known um, uh, ideology in, in, in modern AI um, space. First one is deep neural networks, which has been popular since uh, 2012. And then the second one is self-supervised learning, which I think has been around for almost as long. And some of the recent improvements in both of these areas have allowed for the creation of even larger and more complex model and they are often trained on massive amount of data, often without explicit labels. And the result is, you know, these type of models can learn a range of pattern relationships, which leads to significant improvement in, you know, NLP, uh, vision, audio and speech processing, and even multimodal AI. And uh, from a developer's, you know, researcher's point of view, this model can save time and resources and speed up progress, right? So, you know, in understanding some of these uh, backbone of foundation model is important to uh, be familiar with, with this concept called transfer learning. So um, traditional machine models are trained from scratch and they get set, you know, to perform well. Yeah. However, if you only have a small amount of data, then you can leverage the benefit of transfer learning. And the idea here is what you want to take the knowledge, learn from one task, and then apply that to another task so that you don't require as much label data as you could um, if you were to train from scratch. And for uh, a lot of architecture in early days of neural networks, uh, pre-training is the domain, dominant approach to transfer learning. And you basically pre-train your model on that task and then fine-tune it 
into another dustream task of interest. Uh, in the field of computer vision, we've been doing this since um, 2014, right? Um, usually you train the model on the well-known image net data set, keep the majority of the layers of the architecture, and you probably release either the top top two or top three layers or so with the newly learned words uh, that can be fine-tuned for the dustream task. And alternatively, you can even you know, fine-tune the model end-to-end. And some of the most popular bridge model on computer vision tasks included AlexNet, ResNet, MobileNet, Inception, EfficientNet, um, and YOLO. In the field of uh, NLP, you know, bridge training was initially limited only to the first step, which is called word embeddings. Um, so as you're probably aware, the input to a language model is words. And so one way to encode them, encode them as a vector instead of a word is through one hot encoding. So given a large matrix word, you create an embeddings matrix and embed each word into a real value vector space. And this new matrix is reduced to the dimension on the order of thousands of magnitudes, and perhaps some of this dimension correspond to some um, semantic notion with, with that word, right? So um, the, the model called word to vec trains some similar concept like this back in 2013, and it looked at which words frequently call, call together. The learning objective here was to maximize the cost similarities between these word embeddings. And as a result of that, it can perform some pretty cool demo of vector math on these word embeddings. So for example, when you embed the words king, man, and woman together, you can do some sort of vector math operation to get a vector that is close to the word queen in this embedding space. And after understanding this concept, a lot of people start realizing that, you know, you can it, it is quite useful to see a lot more context to correctly embed the words because, you know, this word can play different roles in a sentence depending on the context. And if you can do this, uh, you know, effectively, you could improve the accuracy in a lot of different industrial tasks. So in 2018, several uh, NLP models include ELMO, UML fit, and the original GPT model have empirically demonstrate how language modeling can be used for pre-training. All of these three methods employ pre-trained language model. And they achieve, you know, the time state the results on a variety of um, you know, NLP tasks, including, you know, um, test classification, question answering, natural language inference, sequence lab labeling, and, and many others more. So that original GPT model um, was built upon the backbone of the now very famous uh, transformer architecture. So it is worth noting that, you know, prior to transformer, a lot of the state of that NLP method was based on recurrent neural networks based methods such as long short term memory and the widely used sequence to sequence architecture. And they uh, effectively you know, process the data uh, sequentially, meaning that they look at each word at a time in the order that the words appear. Now, with the transform architecture, uh, you know, it can parallelize, parallelize language processing by allowing the token in a given body of text to be analyzed simultaneously rather than in a sequence. Um, they rely on a mechanism known as attention to support this parallelization. Um, in very simple term, attention enables a model to consider the relationships between the words, even if they far apart in the text and determine which words and phrases in a passage are most important to pay attention to. And so, you know, uh, with this process of parallelization, just for, they found out that you know are much more computationally efficient than some of the previous uh, RNNs method, allowing this transformer architecture to be trained on larger data set and be with more parameters. And a lot of this three A's architecture based on the transformer uh, had this common characteristic of you know the massive size, which I will talk about in, in a few slides. So in the domain of computer vision, traditionally a lot of work has relied on you know the the well-known convolutional neural networks architecture, right? It's been the dominant architecture in the field for for like decades. Um, however, given the success of transformer in NLP, a lot of researchers start looking into different ways to adapt uh, such architecture to your visual data. And so in 2021, some of the folks over at Google uh, released this work called an image is worth 16 by 16 words, and they introduced this notion called the vision transformer. And this architecture effectively applies the encoder block of the transformer architecture to the image classification problem. Um, in short, they, they split the image into different patches and then provide the sequence linear embeddings of this patch as input to a transformer. Uh, 
So similar to uh, the, the concept of a token in the NLP setting, this image patch can be treated as input. And uh, as you see in architecture, it can include a stem that patched the image and then a body based on the multi-layer transform encoder and then a multi-layer perceptron head uh, with the objective of transforming the global rep representation into some of the output labels. Uh, and empirically speaking, vision transformer um, either you know sets or exceed a lot of different states that results on many image classification data sets while being relatively inexpensive to pre-train. Now, although uh, vision transformers show a lot of potential, they do actually do indeed have some technical problems. And one significant issue here is that they have uh, difficulty with some of the higher resolution images because they require a lot of compute power, which increase rapidly with the image size. And then additionally, um, the token in the vision transform architecture have a, a fixed scale size. And as a result of that, they are not uh, very useful for some of the tasks that involve uh, visual elements of varying size, including video. And so a flurry of research work followed the original transform architecture and most of them uh, did some sort of uh, enhancement to the standard architecture in order to address some of the shortcomings that uh, I just mentioned. And in this slide, I want to talk about, uh, I want to quickly talk about the two uh, uh, more, more uh, popular uh, variants of transformer. The first one coming from Microsoft is called Sweden Transformer. And this one um, introduced two important concepts, hierarchical feature maps and shifted window attention. So this model used hierarchical feature maps to enable some of the advanced techniques for dense prediction. It achieves a linear computation complexity by computing the cell attention mechanism locally within non-overlapping windows that partition an image. And as a result, uh, Sweden Transformer can become a very good backbone for different types of computer vision tasks. And then shifted windows uh, that using you know shifted windows can enhance en enhance modeling power by bridging the windows of some of the preceding preceding layer of the architecture, and as a result of that the strategy is quite efficient in terms of some of the real world latency concerns if you're building like you know real world engineering problems right. All the the query patch within a window share the same key set and making uh, the process of ac accessing the memories in the hardware to become much easier. And the second uh, variant I want to talk about is this one called Perceiver by the team of DeepMind. And uh, Perceiver is an architecture that takes a lot of inspiration from biological system. It uh, it can handle a combination of different mod modalities without relying on any specific assumption about that you know, particular uh, modality. And this architecture introduced a, a small set of latent units to form an attention bottleneck that process eliminates the problems of full complete attention and allows for uh, the creation of very large and, and deep models. It also attends to the most relevant input informed by the previous step. And then secondly, um, if you work in multimodal AI, right, it is very important to uh, differentiate from the input from one modality to another. So with Perceiver, the author associate position specific and modality specific features with every input element so that you know it can it can uh, make that distinction between you know whether it's in the image or it's in text or you know a different type of modality so yeah i hope that um you know uh sort of eventually educate you a little bit about kind of the, the evolution of partition model and how this transfer architecture can be seen and how that has been incorporated into a variety of different uh you know modalities so let's quickly talk about uh, some of the work that led into the birth of plasma language models as we uh, known them today. So G the the original GPT N came out in 2018 and GPT quickly came out after that in 2019 and the name stand for generative prediction transformer. These are decoder early models and they used uh, this concept called mass self tension. They, they just mean that at any point in the output sentence, you can only attend to two input sequence vector that came before that point in the sequence. And this approach is at the core of some of the today most well-known large language model, you know, like, like GPT and, and BART and a variety of the, uh, you know, uh, models that you've seen recently. Um, this original GPT model was trained on 8 million web pages. 
the largest model has about 1.5 million parameters. The task that the GPT-2 model was trained on is to predict the next word in all of the text on the 8 million web page on the training data. And the author found that it works increasingly well with an increasing number of parameters. And then in 2018, uh, team of Google released the model called BERT, which stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation for Transformer. BERT has about 110 million parameters. It is an encoder only, and it's designed for also a predictive modeling task. And it's introduced this original concept called mass language modeling. This means that during the training paradigm, BERT masks out random words in a sequence, and the goal is to predict whatever the, the mass word is. And then in 2020, um, T5 came out, which stood for text to text transformer. The input and output are both text strings, so you can specify the task that the model is supposed to be doing. And unlike you know the other two T5 heads, both encoder and decoder inside the, the architecture. And it was trained on the uh, well known C4 dataset, which is about 100 times larger than Wikipedia. And you know, T5 has about uh, 10 billion parameters you know, compared to some of the other ones. So after a lot of this empirical work that came out, um, it's important to to you know think about how, sort of the systematic process of, of like training and building this model. So uh, nowadays we know this as this called the scaling law equation. So uh, that in very simple terms, scaling laws predict a continued improvement in model quality as we continue to scale up the computational budget. So the team at OpenAI initially investigated the scaling laws of transformer language model, like in 2020. And they show that scaling laws are predictive of the future performance. And I put here in the slide the equations, you know, performance equal data size times parameter size times compute size. And more specifically, uh, the experiments in this work shows that you know the test loss of the model follows a parallel with respect to you know the model size, data size, and the compute used for training. And this suggests that the relationships between all these three variables can be described by this equation. And what, what is implication? Meaning the implication here is that, you know, it can be very useful to optimize different training configuration for large language model. Uh, besides that, you know, uh, the, this work also did some other sort of um, experiment and they found that other architectural details like, you know, uh, tweaking the width of the depth of the network actually have very minimal, minimal effects, you know, uh, within a wire range in the eventual results. And based on um, some of the experiment and the equations in, in this paper, um, it, it can be concluded that, you know, larger models are significantly more sample efficient. In other words, optimal compute efficient training involves training very large model on a relatively modest amount of data and stopping significantly before conversion. So since the publication of that scaling loss paper, there's been a lot of interest in continuing to scale up and which model, right? And it's been probably about two years, or two, three years, right? Since since the the um, from some from that work. And um GPTT was one of the state of the art models in 2020. It was about hundred times larger than GPT and GPT2 with 175 billion parameters. And due to you know that that size of the model, um GPT theory exhibit some of the uh, never before seen capabilities in a variety of few short and zero short learning tasks. And um, they found that the more examples you read the model, the better the performance will be. And the larger the model, the better the performance will get. The team over the Google you know, did this empirical analysis in 2022 in a work called Emerging Abilities of Large Language Model. And the goal is to explore some of these, you know, emission abilities that are present in larger, larger model, but not in the smaller ones. Um, highly recommend reading it, give a look, but um, in short, it, it examines different research that analyze the influence of scale, comparing models, different size, trend with varying computational resources. And they found that, you know, for many different few short and zero short learning tasks, the behavior of the model search unpredictably from random performance to like above random at a very specific scale threshold. Uh, and for, for instance, like, you know, maybe if you pass the like, 70 billion parameters in the size, in, in the model size, then the performance just kind of shoot up um, unpredictably. Uh, so continuing on some of this empirical analysis in 2022, 
DeepMind proposed this work called the Chinchilla scaling loss to create compute optimal models. And this is a, a little bit more accurate scaling loss formula than the original one proposed by OpenAI. So when we talk about the analysis that the authors did in this work, they trained over 400 large language model with a wiring chip parameters from 70 million to 60 billion on a wiring chip token from 5 billion to 500 billion tokens. <laughs> and by predicting the optimal amount of data given the number of model parameters, the author derived uh, different form of formulas for the model in training set size. And they found that most of the you know, large language model at the time you know, are under chain, meaning that they haven't seen enough data. In order to verify this, they trained an another large model called Gopher. The Gopher has about 280 billion parameters and 200 billion token. And you know, with Chinchilla, they reduced the number of parameters to 70 billion while increasing the, the, the data fourfold to 1.4 trillion tokens. And despite having fewer parameters, Chinchilla, you know, actually, you know, exceed the performance of Gopher. And this suggests that, you know, both motor size and training, training tokens are equally important, not just like either one of these, you know, uh, variables. And uh, since some of the formal empirical analysis of scaling laws, uh, you know, we've seen many, many more you know, language model that have been released. And some of the ones I put here in the slide only talk about the one that coming from academia. Like obviously there's a lot of commercial models coming out lately as well uh, that have been not been uh, able to cover here in the slide. But um, generally speaking, some of these model, you know, achieve a lot of different, um, st instead of that, few shock results at the time of its release uh, and simply by, you know, scaling the model size and tuning on larger data sets from more diverse sources. Some of the examples included uh, Megatron LM, GLAM, Lambda, uh, Megatron Turing, NRG, uh, and Palm. You know. So I talk a lot about like the scaling loss for for NLP, but uh, it turns out you know this this concept also applies for computer vision. So this work from the team at Google in 2022, um, they they conduct experiment on a variety of uh, different vision transform architecture, and they did the same sort of like type of experiment by you know varying the the parameter size, right, from 5 million to 2 billion, varying the, the, the range of data set from 1 million to 3 billion training images, as well as the compute budget from um, less than one TPU core day to more than 10,000 know, TPU core days. And they finally show that simultaneously scaling total compute and motor size is very effective. And the most optimal strategy here is to increase both the size of the model with you know more available you know additional compute right um, and finally they found that vision customers some of these models with, with sufficient training data roughly follows a power law in performance and then uh, larger model tend to perform better in, in a lot of different you know few short learning uh, experiments so you know uh, so I talk about that that vision customer architecture right and Thanks to you know, that concept, there's been a lot of increased interest in building the sort of architecture that can combine vision and language more modalities in the same um, you know, training and, and, and learning paradigm. And, and, and briefly speaking, this hybrid vision and language model can demonstrate very impressive coverages in different tasks, like captioning of an image, gener generating new images from scratch, or even like doing visual question answering. And typically speaking, this startup vision language model consists of three key elements, an image encoder, a text encoder, and a strategy to fuse the information from these two encoders. So for the next few slides, I want to quickly uh, review some of the most well-known models in vision and wish model research over the past two years. So in 2021, uh, OpenAI uh, introduced uh, the, the CLIP you know, method, Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. So the input to CLIP is 400 and millions image to text pairs that will crawl from the internet. And it encodes the text using a vanilla transformer, it encodes the image using uh, a vision transformer, and it applies you know, a learning paradigm called contrastive learning to train this model. Uh, and in, in very simple term, contrastive learning match the correct uh, image and text space using some sort of um, you know, similarity uh, score. You know, it, it can be anything, right? but cos cos is probably the, the most um, relevant one. Um, with this powerful train model, you can map image and text using embeddings, even on unseen data. And there are two ways to do this. The first way is to use a linear probe by training a simple uh, logistic uh, regression classifier on top of the features that clip outputs after performing inference. And alternatively, you can even use you know, 
zero shot technique that can encode all the text labels and compare them to the encoded images. What approach worked equally well, uh, and uh, the, in the paper they did, they found that you know actually uh, creating a linear classifier tends to perform slightly better. Um, so to clarify this, uh, I, I want to make sure that you, you understand that clip does not directly go from image to text or vice versa. They they they, they use embeddings to like perform this uh, uh, transformation, and this embedding space, which you can kind of see here in the slide consists of like different image and text notion, semantic notion of image and text, all much in the same uh, embedding space. And then as a result, as a result of that, uh, this embedding space is extremely useful for performing search across different uh, modalities. So I, I spent a lot of time talking about CLIP because it served as the backbone uh, you know, ideology for a lot of the, the vision language model uh, that came after that. So, um, just one year after Google introduced this work called Koka, standing for contrastive captioner. It's an, another foundation model that combines contrastive learning and uh, generative learning. And it used an um, encoder decoder architecture that has been modified and trained with both contrastive loss, contra contrastive loss and captioning loss. And um, you know, by, by with that training paradigm, it allows the model to learn both the global representation from unimodal image and text embedding as well as, as some of the finer grain uh, region level features from the multi model embeddings. In late 2022, uh, DeepMind created a group of visual language models called Flamingo. And this model can do uh, many different things, you know, even with very few samples of uh, input and output data. And these Flamingo models have uh, two key components. The first is a vision model that can understand the visual scenes. And the second is the language model that can help with, uh, with reasoning. Uh, and the models use their virtual knowledge to work together. Um, and it's important to note that uh, Flamingo can, can you know, take in as input very high quality image or video thanks to uh, the perceiver architecture, as you see in the slide, which I talked a little bit about uh, in the previous slide uh, on, 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 um, on, on the slide on the transformer variance, right? And as a result of that architecture, it can analyze a large number of visual input features and produce a small number of visual tokens. So yeah, thanks to some of these uh, architectural innovation, uh, the Flamingo model family can connect strong pre-trained models for vision and for language and can handle sequences of mixed modalities you know, between visual and text data. Uh, in this work, the biggest version is called Flamingo ADB and it has 80 billion parameters, right? And it's set uh, and it records on different few short learning tasks, you know, that involve uh, understanding language, image, and and videos. And you know, there's a lot of innovation language model research coming out from the academia industry in the past few 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 months, actually. So, in this slide, I just want to talk quickly about the two um, that is probably like gather uh, a bit more uh, interest from 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 the public, right? So. The one on the left side came from Microsoft. It's called Cosmos One, and it's a multimodal language model that can perceive different modalities, learn the, the unique context of that modalities, and also follow instruction given by by, uh, by the prompter. So the model can generate, generate text based on the previous context and handle text and other modalities using a transformer-based causal language model. Uh, Cosmos One was trained using various types of data and can perform well in different scenarios including understanding and creating language, rec recognizing images, and answering questions based on images. The one on the left side comes from Google, it's called PAMI, and it's an embodied multimodal language model that can handle various reasoning tasks based on observation from different sources and using different embodiments, including internet scale language, vision, and visual language domain. Um, so in this work, um, they, they try out different um, architecture depth as well, and the biggest one is called PAMI, uh, 562B, and it has about 562 billion parameters, and it can reason about different things that have been trained beforehand. It can even tell jokes based on the image, performing different robotic tasks like perceiving, talking, and planning. It's definitely very impressive, and you know, highly recommend um, some of the viewers to check out what this work. Awesome, yeah. So, so for the last uh, segment of my presentation, I will talk about uh, this new paradigm of uh, video foundation models. So, um, you know, uh, like, I, I think that video understanding 
some of these tasks have become increasingly important in our society these days, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, video content happening in social media and also this increasing use of even surveillance cameras, right, in, in public spaces. And as a result of that, there's a growing need for uh, building sophisticated video understanding system. However, despite some of the importance of this problem, it actually has received uh, little attention compared to some of the text and image understanding tasks that I talked about in the, the previous slide. And this is due to a couple of major technical challenges. So the first one is that, um, you know, video processing uh, entails very high computing burden. So video are much larger in terms of size, you know, uh, in, compared to like the text modalities or the image modalities. And videos also require uh, significantly more processing power to perform analysis. And this is issue is even more pronounced with uh, adopting the transformer architecture, which has quadratic complexity with respect to token time. Um, so yeah, so we talk about compute a little bit, but also there's also like the, the, the actual modeling aspect of it as well, right? So if you think about inside a video, you are dealing with some sort of uh, like a like an image or, or or text moving to time, right? Uh, so put it in, in technical term, it, it means that, you know, you have to perform this sort of temporal modeling, right? And this temporal dimension definitely must be taken into account when you perform analysis. And as a result of that, uh, when you work with video, you, you need uh, specific and specialized techniques and models that uh, are not very uh, commonly used in compared to like some of the other modalities. And then finally, um, in addition to some of the visual information presented in the video clips, there are also uh, synchronized audio cues that requires additional processing. So, you know, in, in a video frame, like you have sounds, conversation, um, right, happening inside a video frame. So you want to take into account these audio cues when you perform your analysis. Um, and it's important that these audio cues are often just as important as the visual information presented in the video. And you have to make sure that you you process the audio cues in conjunction with, with the visual elements, right? So so how do you, um, I guess, the ally the, the, the audio modalities with the visual modalities in the same, you know, uh, latent space is actually uh, quite, quite um, an, an unique and, and challenging, you know, research direction that has been going on in the past uh, couple of years, right? So yeah, these are the, the major three challenges to towards video modeling that so I want to bring it up. Uh, although, you know, these are some important challenges, there's actually been quite a, a lot of progress being, being made in video understanding research. So for the next few slides, I want to quickly um, go over some of the, uh, the most important kind of video photoshop model work that has been um, designed to tackle some of these challenges. So the first one, uh, the earliest one actually, you know, in 2019, is called Video Bird, and it's come from Google. It applies sub sub supervision to video. So it used three pre-existing methods, automatic speech recognition, like the quantization for spatial temporal visual features, and then a bird model to sequence uh, for, for sequence of tokens. And um, all these three components work together in order to model the relationships between the visual and the linguistic domain. So in order to make the bird, uh, the, the bird architecture works with video, the authors, they turn the raw video data into visual words using the vector quantization um, uh, paradigm. And this helped the model to focus only on the important parts of the video and how you know these parts uh, transform over time, right? Uh, and practically speaking, they, they apply video bird to, uh, they, they evaluate uh, the model on different video captioning tasks and it said, it uh, actually you know, outperformed a lot of existing um, hand design architecture at the time. And the work here is called All in One by the team, um, you know, from Ac Academia in National University of Singapore. It is a video language model designed for pre-training that can capture video language representation from raw visual and textual signals in a uh, unified backbone architecture. So looking here in, in the slide, you know, it used a temporal token rolling operation. This one right here. To capture a temporal representation of sparsely sample frames without, without adding you know, extra parameters or increasing 
time complexity, you know, and so this is the way that they use to, to capture that temporal dimension that I just mentioned in the previous uh, two slides. Uh, yeah, and then it performed pretty well on four separate dash stream video language tasks, you know, video question answering, text to video retrieval, multiple choice Q&A, and then uh, visual common sense reasoning. Microsoft also came into the scene and they introduced XClip, which is a framework that adapts language image model to general video recognition. And it has uh, two separate um, components. It has a cross-frame communication transformer, as well as a multi-frame integration transformer. So the former one allows the frames to extract information using uh, message tokens, while the latter one um, transfer frame level representation to um, video level, right? And uh, Xclips use video content information to enhance text prompting using uh, a video specific prompting scheme. So in different fully supervised zero shot and free shot experiment, they found that this, this Xclip you know, framework performs pretty well despite uh, limited label data. Um, yeah, so this work here is called Intern Video, and it's actually uh, one of the best performing video photography models. And most impressive one, um, it combines two popular self supervised learning paradigm mass video modeling, and then multi multimodal contrastive learning. It used learnable interactions to derive new features from these two separate transformers, and it combined benefit for both generative and contrastive learning tasks. And uh, I, th I think the impressive one. That I want to mention here is in this in this paper they um, the the evaluation um, scheme they use a video understanding benchmark that included tasks like action understanding video language alignment and open world video application tasks right and then inter video performed decently well in, in most of these um, different tasks and you know they they represent some of the core values of generic video perception um, yeah so that's that's why it's pretty impressive because uh, the evaluation paradigm is more. I guess broader in terms of scope, uh, which you know move us closer into like generic video understanding, right? Unlike see the other one that I mentioned, only personalized to a very specific uh, evaluation paradigm. Uh, this is NVIDIA a work called Merlot Reserve, and it's a model that can learn multi-model neural script knowledge representation of videos by jointly performing reasoning over video frames, text, and audio. The model is designed to represent, to represent videos over time and across different modalities. It is trained on over 20 million YouTube videos through a new contrastive mass span learning objective in you know, order to learn from both text and audio cell supervision. Right. And as a result of that, it can capture some of the semantic and temporal relationships between different elements of video, which allow it to learn a very rich um, you know, representation of video content that can be used for wiring ship. Um, video understanding task. So you see here the, the the unique one about this one is that it incorporates the audio component that they talk about. You know, in the some of the previous slide, right? That's synchronized audio cues. Um, here is is pretty uh, pretty relevant, right? Video Coca is an approach to uh, video text modeling that leverages the the Coca work that I mentioned. Uh, I, th I think uh, back in in the in the section on vision language model. And, and COCA stands for contrastive captioner. So video COCA essentially, you know, use the contrastive captioning models to gen generate candidate sentences for, for the video captioning. And then um, these sentences are then scored by another transformer based model uh, based on the re relevant um, to the target video. And it performed pretty well for video captioning tasks. V2SEC is another video captioning model. And this one, um, is a uh, single stage. It's been pre-trained on uh, narrative video. It takes uh, frames and transcribes speech from an entry video that is several minutes long as the input. It then outputs the event captions together with the temporal localization in the video by predicting a single sequence of tokens. And the architecture here relies on the T file language model using special time tokens, allowing it to seamlessly predict event boundaries and textual description in the same output sequence. Um, it was preaching using the the uh, uh, how to 110 million narrative videos, and given this narrative video, uh, they reformulate sentence boundaries as transcribed speech 
as uh, serial event boundaries and use the transcribed speech sentences as serial event captions. Um, so yeah, I put here in the kit that shows like how exactly it works from the video frames to the final um, speech caption. The only thing here is like it, they, yeah, they they they, um, they can capture that temporal localization pretty well using that that learning paradigm, which uh, yeah, like I said, is quite unique compared to some of the other previous actors that I mentioned. And the final work that we we'll talk about in this presentation is called Track Anything. And this is designed for video object tracking and segmentation. Uh, so Track Anything is developed upon um, the segment anything model, SAM uh, for short. And, and SAM is come, came from Meta, I think back in either March or, or April, I think. Um, and SAM is a published model for image segmentation, focused on promptable segmentation tasks, meaning that you can you can perform prompt engineering. You would prompt it like, hey, um, segment means like this scene, right? And then Sam I'm gonna, yeah, gonna perform uh, segment, uh, segmenting uh, objective uh, for, for, for that scene. And uh, yeah, check anything, basically just adapt that that same uh, paradigm uh, prompt engineering for, for video segmentation. During tracking, the users can change the object they wanna track or correct the region of interest if you know there are any ambiguity um, they want to correct for. And so as a result of that, check anything is quite suitable for different video of tracking and segmentation with uh, short chains, right? For instance, like in a large complex video, you have a lot of you know, zoom in, zoom out, um, shooting from above to shooting from, from below. And with these short chains, it's very um, useful, right? For 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 track for, for you know, tracking segmentation of these video objects. And also pretty useful for uh, visualized development and, and data annotation for for some of this work, right? Uh, you want to like doing labeling of data, right? For to to construct your tra training data set for your video uh, modeling work. And finally, it can uh, can be quite suitable for some of the uh, downstream video tasks that really focus on the object, like video editing and video in painting. So um, yeah, like as a video editor, you probably have to um, manipulate right the the objects in your scenes some way, right? And so by pinpointing these objects, you can, yeah. can do that uh, much more uh, flexibly and, and uh, comfortably, right? Awesome. So yeah, so this is a, a, a conclusion um, slide that I want to talk about. Um, so if we talk about, um, yeah, we went through an, an introduction to partition models, we touched on uh, concept transfer learning and word embeddings. We talk about the original transfer picture and uh, the variance on different modalities. Then I talk about the birth of Blast language model from some of the original, original uh, uh, GPT, GPT family from OpenAI to like Google's T5 to the bird one, right? And we talk about the scan loss equation, how that is becoming uh, fundamental uh, as an empirical notion to help uh, researchers and 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 you know engineers uh, optimize training configuration for larger language model because of their emotion abilities. We talk about the rise of some of the large vision language model that can combine, you know, um, more than uh, one model is thinking about both visual and text models in the same uh, learning paradigm. And this is all thanks to the, the open side clip, uh, uh, you know, back in 2021, contrastive uh, learning for, for image pre-training and clip inspired, you know, different work like Google's Coca, DeepMind's Flamingo, Microsoft, Cosmos One, as well as Google's Pami. And then finally, we talk about the new paradigm of video for additional models, most specifically, we talk about uh, the unique challenges of video modeling, right? From the high compute burden to the temporal modeling to uh, aligning um, audio and, and visual together. And then I talk about, uh, you know, uh, I guess a, a portfolio of video foundation models uh, in the past two years, from video bird to all in one to intern video, Madoc Reserve, video coca, video electric, anything. Um, and then the, the, so just, I guess, one quick uh, uh, note about, you know, to our labs, kind of where where we come from and why we become so interested in in this whole, um, you know, evolution is because, uh, yeah, we were we are building multi model foundation models for video understanding, and we leverage a lot of these, um, you know, fundamental work here. Like we, we leverage like transformer, cliff, and and you know the training data set, right? All those things, you know, to construct our our, our own uh, foundation models for video understanding called Marengo, um, and it can it perform different. Uh, different tasks, and they can like learn text and audio and 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 and, uh, and vision in in the same uh, learning paradigm. 
Yeah, so I actually wrote a whole full blog post on this topic on, on our website that I put here in the screen. So if you want to uh, go deeper and, and kind of zoom in and double click on some of the points that I mentioned, feel free to check out the, the blog post uh, I put here in the slide. Uh, I also run a Discord community um, called Monty Modernize that, um, that serves as a, as a venue to uh, facilitate interaction between tinkerers, you know, fathers, researchers, developers who are interested in um, multimodal research and application. Like I think this space is very new and and at least, you know, compared to like Gen AI or LRMs, it, it is quite uh, researching, but I think it's going to become very important in, in, in the future. So if you're interested in talking about this topic and extreme interest with, with other folks, uh, yeah, uh, good luck to, for, for you to join our Discord. I put here the QR code on the slide. Um, we, um, we also like host a weekly webinars uh, to share discussion uh, about multimodal research, of which uh, Frank has been a speaker just two weeks ago talking about uh, sort of the multimodal uh, uh, evolution of backend embeddings, which is pretty cool. Just got to see how, how you know, Milvers and Zilex is thinking about incorporating multimodal in space. So, yeah, if you like building or, or, or I guess studying something new or, or just like doing research in space, we'd love to have you join and probably present your, our work to, to our communities. Um, and so with that, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here for my for, for presentation and welcoming any question um, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, James, for that awesome presentation. Um, and for folks in the audience, uh, for participants, attendees of this webinar, if you can paste your question in the Q&A or in the chat, uh, we'll sort of get to some of those as we, uh, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, but I guess before that happens, James, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, maybe spend two, three minutes, talk about what 12 Labs provides from an API perspective or from you know a SaaS or other services perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 12 Labs, um, so com company, um, I guess that started in corporate about two years ago and, and originally started out as, um, as, as a group of like researchers, really uh, building models. To, to understand video, right? So, so at our core the company, um, like I said, building foundation model for video understanding. Um, so that's from a research part of view. And then from from the product uh, part of view, um, we um, we offer uh, at the moment two separate APIs. Uh, first one is called video search, and the second one is called video classification. Video search means that you can search for you know specific um, people, objects, moments, activities happening inside of, of video clips using you know, natural language query. And video classification, classification is an API, you know, means that you can um, uh, classify your videos into a specific categories, you know, using, uh, you know, like just by uh, using a predefined crowd shoot labels, right? Or even you can even perform zero shot classification by just inputting like a new uh, labels when you perform classifier. Um, so yeah, those are the two major API uh, that, that we offer. Uh, and you even notice like both of these API are focused on um, discriminate tasks, meaning that they they leverage embeddings to perform uh, search or classification. And, and we're also working hard into uh, some of the uh, generative tasks as well, which soon to be released in, in upcoming months. And we are looking at different tasks like video captioning, um, video uh, question answering, right? Meaning that given the video as an input, can can you um, generate like the, the captions, right? For, for that for that video, or you can interact with, with the videos by asking us asking a question, right? And so um, a lot of the slides that I talk about in, in uh, in my presentation, talk about some of these unique models for that. And we are, uh, I guess, you know, trying to um, take inspiration from the work in order to incorporate it into a product, right? Um, so th those are the major APIs that we have. Uh, and the unique, I, I guess, one final thing I want to talk about is that uh, we we are pretty uh, industry agnostic, meaning that uh, we try to build like a, a single uh, model uh, under hood and stay horizontal, and it, it can adapt for different uh, downstream video domain, right? So we work with spot video, um, security video, um, you know, e-commerce video, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, we don't we don't like you know, uh, pigeonhole ourselves into like any specific um, domain. Um, yeah, hope that answered the question. 
Yeah, absolutely. That was great. Uh, we do have we do have one question here. Um, and then, you know, I think as some of the other ones come in, we can also have a discussion as well. I also have a couple that I would like to ask. The yeah. first one is from Siddharth and he he's asking, I'm working on a similarity search platform uh, with Zillas. Is there a proper way to vectorize the images and videos using the appropriate models from 12 labs? So he's currently using BERT and mini LM for the text embedding creation. So do you have any advice for him there, James? Yeah. Um Let's see, is there a proper way to vectorize pictures and videos using appropriate models? Um so if you can you can, you know, I think the 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 first thing the first step is probably to look out any open source so solution out there, right? To to perform embeddings on your images and video, as mentioned. Uh open nice clip is, is the very popular one. And there's a different version of, of the model available on GitHub. I think open clip is just one of them. So you can you know, try to fuck that and, and you know, download locally and, and try to uh, work with it. Um, and then, up, if, if, if you know, if you want to improve, improve performance or change anything, you can you can make complication for that and then look for more of a source solution. Um, in terms from from a 12 up perspective, we actually will soon to soon to be released uh, our video embeddings API, meaning that, you know, we're going to make our models available via, via the API, right, for, for, for more technical uh, audience to um, to use, and so that they're probably going to be like towards the end of this year. So um, not towards the end of this year, probably yeah, September or, or October or something. So you can um, you know um, use our API to to call our model uh, and then uh, perform more modeling on your respective um, picture or, or video. Um, so yeah, that's that's. Uh, I yeah, love... that, that's for me. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great response. I sort of have a follow-up question to that, uh, James, which is when for 12 Labs' upcoming embedding API, is that going to be limited? Is that going to be, let's say, I, I want to be able to take a clip of a video and understand what's going on there, or will I be able to uh, embed? Is, it, is there going to be a limit to the number of frames in the video for the embedding, or is it going to be something that is... You know, I can have, I can give it a one and a half hour long video and have it have it output multiple embeddings for me. Yeah, um, I, I think at the point we are still trying out different. I, I I think like you know one of the limitation with with uh, with our models right now is is that definitely that sort of long long context right um, input right. Um, you're probably are very familiar with it, given even some of the language worked recently on like try to improve the size of the long. Uh, of the um of the, of the of the token size, right? So in in video, obviously, you know, like it's the longer the the uh, the input of the video, the the more complexity we have to do, you know, to to to, to process it, right? And so I think right now, is it, like an hour is, is probably like super long for us, you know, to to handle. And so I think like any any between like like less than thirty minutes is probably um. Ideal, you know, for for us to 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 perform the indexing process and um and and uh, allow you to perform the search and classification afterwards. Uh, we definitely like looking at different ways to to improve the performance in, and take into uh, as in, as input longer um longer video size, right? Um, and that actually you know take, include different um criteria. Like we are working hard on the compute. Aspect of it, how to train model to more more efficiently, you know, to take into account the long input, but also like from modeling as well. How can how can you, as I said again, perform alignment between visual and and, and audio? Because the, the longer the, the video, the more uh, I guess intelligent the model has had to be in order to pay attention to the most specific part, right? So yeah. attention here really means like you're not gonna look at every single frame, right? You have to detect, you know, when this is short change or, or sequence. A battery change, right? Then, then attend to that. Then, uh, and take it out. Um, so not just the length of the video, but also the the tired video as well, right? Like if you like a educational video, which is one person speaking, then I guess the longer it doesn't gonna take a lot of compute. But like if it's like an action movie, right? Like a lot of lot of lot of short chains, then it's definitely gonna take a lot of analysis as opposed to 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 process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I sort of have a follow-up question about that as well. Uh, you know, we were talking about scaling laws and you were talking about in one of your earlier slides, 
Mm-hmm. And in particular, I think this is very, very relevant for video because when it comes to video, there's a lot of, there's just so much data out there, right? At the same time, I think we've seen a lot of not necessarily public research work, but uh, there's been, there's, so GPT-4, for example, I think is known to be an A-way mixture of experts. Um, and each expert, I think, is 220 billion parameters, something like that, so not 200 billion parameters. Do you think we've reached, at least for language models, do you think we've reached the limits of that uh, of those scaling laws? And do you think we're even close for video? Yeah. Um, so happy to sort of have a back and forth here as well. Yeah. So re- regarding the limits of uh, um, data size, for, sorry, uh, the, the, the limit of the training data for, for language, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, not, uh, I, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of work or like a lot, a lot of conversation lately about like, you know, kind of even like a synthetic data, right. For, for, for text or something along the extent you, I think, I guess like, you know, you probably have, have a more purview on, on this topic given, uh, you know, the, the work, um, on, on vector for text, right. Um, uh, but like. If I, if we talk about from a video part of view, I, I just think that there's still a lot of untapped potential in terms of video data that can be harnessed, right? Like, you know, content from, from social, TikTok, YouTube, um, you know, et cetera, are definitely like, uh, ex- not just exist, but also like being generated in, in even more, um, in, in order of magnitude, right? Compared to the, the, the inside analysis of it, right? And then, so that, that's one, one point. So my point is there's a lot of potential with existing video data. And then secondly, um, companies like, like Runway, Synthesia, et cetera, actually performing video generations, meaning that, you know, they generate net new video from scratch. So that means they even more video, right, to, to process, to, to use that string data, right? So I think there's still a lot of video over there for us to to to, to train a model on and, and to apply second laws on, right? Um, so I, I think for the time being, um, we, we're not super uh, worried about like running out of video data to, to trade it on. Uh, it, it's, yeah. it's just it's just a matter of like, you know, um, how to find them, how to harness them uh, efficiently. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. For sure. That makes a lot of sense. I know we're sort of running up on time here. Uh, so folks, if there is anything else, if there's any other questions that you'd like James, James to answer, please add them into the Q&A or into the chat. Either is okay. And one thing, one last thing that I want to add, James, is... Uh, when your when that embedding when that video embedding endpoint is available, um, love to have you post about it in our middle yeah. Slack channel. Uh, you know, just to let the broader community know and let folks know, hey, now we do have a way for you to embed videos as well. And I think with that, I'll I'll kick it back to Emily. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you, James. Yeah, just just one note on on, on Frank's boy. Um, he, uh, yeah, super quick notice, like. Uh, when when that embeddings become available, I think one, one of our main goal, and this is relevant to to Zilex, is like to for first to to integrate and partner with different uh, vector database vendors because like you know users of let's say Mivers can can uh, extract right embeddings from from our model and then use use the Mivers to to store them and perform retrieval etc. Right, so I think uh, yeah, definitely excited to 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 have those those kind of conversation moving forward and hopefully any any of the users can can. Um, can benefit from that so soon soon to be released yeah. yeah we're excited about that as well thank you james absolutely thank you so much james what a great presentation i know our audience uh learned a whole lot um so thank you so much for all of those who joined us uh keep an eye on the zillas.com event uh, calendar for more upcoming sessions like this and we will hope to see you on a future webinar thank you all